Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at VCU, welcome to our November Alumni Lunch and Learn session. Uh, all eyes on Virginia analyzing elections 2023 with Dr. Bob Holsworth and Dr. Robin McDougall. Today's session is in collaboration with the VCU Alumni Political Science Caucus. For those of you joining us for the first time, uh, Wilder School hosts uh, monthly events like this one um, where uh, change agents, thought leaders, and policymakers provide insights and commentary on relevant topics of the day. None more relevant than speaking on uh, last week's election. My name is Stephen Dozier, and I am the Senior Director of Development and Alumni Engagement at the Wilder School. Before we start, I'd like to share a few quick announcements. The Wilder School remains at the forefront of our field and continues to rise in the rankings. U.S. News and World Report ranks our school's public affairs program at number 39, placing us in the top 15 percent of more than 250 schools across the United States. And we hold the top 40, rank, top 40 rankings in four program specialty areas, as you can see here. The fall 2023 Wilder School in Action magazine is available online. So use the QR code on your screen to read some fantastic stories from the school, um, like the one featured on the cover. Our spring 2024 application deadline is December 1st for master's programs and December 15th for fall 2024 PhD applications. Please visit or share the link with the colleagues or friends or family that you know might be interested. It's that time of the year again. Fall commencement is gonna be on December 9th uh, Saturday from 1.30 to 3 at the Greater Richmond uh, Convention Center. If you have questions, please email us. We'd be happy to accommodate. And uh, without further ado, I introduce Dr. Susan Gooden, our esteemed dean. Thank you so much, Stephen, and welcome everyone to our November Lunch and Learn. I know that all of us are very eager to hear from our guest presenter today, who is a good friend of the Wilder School, Dr. Bob Holsworth. And I know his analysis will be on point and uh, very in depth. Uh, before we get to that, I do want to share with you a very important announcement. I want to make everyone aware of a special event that we are hosting for in honor of the namesake of our school, Governor Wilder. This is a national ovation to Governor Wilder, honoring his 70 years of leadership and service. There are going to be two amazing events. On January the 17th, which is Governor Wilder's 93rd birthday, we will be holding a documentary premiere where a film will be shown uh, on some of the lesser known aspects of Governor Wilder's life here in Richmond at five o'clock. Um, and then on Saturday, January the 20th, this will be the National Ovation Black Tie Gala that will be held at the Washington Hilton in Washington, D.C. We are delighted to be collaborating with both Virginia Union University and Howard University, uh, both of which, of course, are Governor Wilder's alma maters on both of these events. So please mark your calendars now. You'll be hearing much more about this um, in the months to come. Uh, but this does promise to be a grand event, a grand celebration for the namesake of our school, the 66th governor of Virginia and the first elected African-American governor in the nation, Governor Wilder. Uh, but before we get to that, I know today we are focused on doing an analysis and hearing more about uh, the election, last week's uh, elections here in Virginia. And our moderator for today's session is Dr. Robin McDougall. Dr. McDougall, I've worked with for a number of years. We actually started at VCU on the exact same day. Um, she is our Associate Dean of Research and Outreach, and she is an Associate Professor of Criminal Justice in the Wilder School. Um, our distinguished speaker, Bob Holsworth, has had many roles at VCU, uh, been a previous director of the Wilder School, Dean of Humanities and Sciences, and, and Board of Visitors member. But the other thing is that he was the first director of our Centers and Institutes, which Dr. McDougall directs now. 
And so she directs our Centers and Institute. She leads our Commonwealth Poll. And she's also heavily involved in our capital semester program, which begins next month for our students as they work and complete internships in the General Assembly. So uh, Robin does a lot for the school and she also keeps a close eye on Virginia politics. So not, no one any better to uh, moderate today's session than Dr. McDougall. So I'll turn it over to you, Robin. Thank you so much, Dean Gooden. And it really is my honor and privilege to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Bob Holsworth is one of the leading political analysts in Virginia. He's a regular political analyst for WTVR CBS 6 here in Richmond, and his comments on Virginia and national politics have been run in newspapers from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times to the Washington Post, as well as almost all other newspapers across the country and throughout the Commonwealth. He has appeared on almost all major television channels speaking about politics, including the BBC and Fuji Television. Dr. Holsworth was named one of the 100 influentials in Virginia politics by Campaign and Elections Magazine. And as Dean Good mentioned, he is the founding director of both the Center for Public Policy and the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs. Dr. Holsworth received the Outstanding Faculty Member Award at VCU, excuse me, the Outstanding Teaching Award at VCU, and the Outstanding Faculty Member Award from CHEV while he was serving here at the university. He is currently the Managing Principal of Decide Smart, a firm that provides analysis and planning for agencies, local governments, nonprofits, and private sector companies with government interests. As well, Dr. Holsworth has served on a number of boards and commissions, including chairing Governor McDonald's Independent Bipartisan Redistricting Commission, serving as the executive director of Governor Warner's Commission on Efficiency and Effectiveness in State Government, and serving as the co-staff director on Governor Wilder's Commission on the Future of Virginia's Urban Areas. Dr. Holsworth completed two terms on VCU's Board of Visitors and served five years as the chair of the Great Aspirations Scholarship Program here in Richmond, Virginia. He currently serves on the board of RVA 757 Connects and received his PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Holsworth, thank you so much for being with us today mm -hmm. and the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, great, Robin, thanks very much. Thanks to the Dean. And I just also want to say, um, how extraordinary it is to watch what uh, Dean Gooden, Professor McDougall, and the really the amazing staff of the Wilder School uh, has done over the years. It's just great to work with you, and it's just fabulous uh, to be to remain involved. So let me just begin uh, by trying to talk about what happened in uh, last week and what it means. And I guess the best way I'm going to start is really try to just begin by outlining uh, what was at stake. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how the election was framed by the redistricting, talk about the results, and then speak about what that's going to mean for the upcoming General Assembly session that starts in January, and also what it may mean for Governor Yunkin as well, and then look forward to taking everybody's questions there. So um, let me begin just uh, very briefly by outlining four things that, four key features that were at stake in this election. The first was simply whether Virginia was going to continue with divided government or whether or not uh, Governor Yunkin was going to be successful in keeping the House and flipping the Senate and having uh, what they called their Republican trifecta. Uh, that's very important because for most of the past 20 years in Virginia, we've had divided government uh, with the exception of the last two years of the Northern administration and two years in the McDonald administration. And when government is not divided, uh, the um, sitting governor and the party that's in power has a lot more opportunity to do what it wants. So that was at stake. Uh, secondly, there had been a lot of talk about Governor Youngkin's national aspirations. He had been in many ways, uh, what I might call the darling of the donor class. There were a lot of people encouraging him uh, to get into the race. In fact, a few weeks before the election, there was a, a gathering of donors in Williamsburg, uh, many of whom thought that Governor Yunkin would make a better presidential candidate. So that aspiration was sort of on the table in some way as well. Connected to that 
with the fact that Governor Yunkin had put forward what he called a 15-week limit and what other people call a 15-week ban on abortion. But it was an effort to try to find a way out of the Republican dilemma that they've had in so many special elections since Dobbs, that Republicans were losing uh, election after election after the, on the abortion issue. And Governor Yunkin thought, well, he proposed what he called a compromise that he would think was a potential way out for Republicans. And there were a lot of people looking at this nationally to see whether or not this model would actually work on that. And then finally, I would say there was, um, what was at stake was uh, the political identity of Virginia. Uh, Virginia had been a, a purple state trending blue for the last decade and a half until Governor Youngkin's election in 2021. And if Governor Youngkin succeeded in, uh, in winning this trifecta with the General Assembly, what you would say then is that we would then have been a purple state trending red. So there was a real question about had Virginia's political identity changed or was the 2021 election of Governor Yunkin a bit of an outlier or a bit of anomaly, largely because it occurred uh, at a time when so many parents were frustrated with 18 months of remote learning during COVID. So those were the, the stakes at the election. And it took place in the framework of this redistricting that had occurred that was um, a distinctive and unusual uh, kind of redistricting in Virginia. Up to this time, redistricting had been controlled by the um, majority political party in each chamber, and they would propose a redistricting formula um, that was politically grounded and politically based. And then the governor would approve or tweak this. And uh, at the end of the day, it was controlled by the elected officials. Uh, Virginia, the previous year, had approved, Virginians had approved a constitutional amendment establishing a bipartisan commission to do this redistricting. That would be eight Democrats and eight Republicans, and they would get in a room over a few months and come up and draw the maps. I always knew that had no chance of working because as um, uh, Dr. McDougall had said, I had chaired an advisory commission for Bob McDonald in 2021 that had six Democrats, six Republicans. I was uh, the independent chair. And at the end of the day, uh, that group couldn't agree on a single map. They came up with two or three maps that looked a little better than the ones we had previously done. But even an advisory group couldn't do this. So what happened is that these folks met. Again, they couldn't reach an agreement. And the backup plan in the uh, constitutional amendment was to take this to the Supreme Court. They redrew the lines and um, they had two political scientists and they redrew the lines. They were technically better lines than we had had ever seen before in Virginia, probably. But at the same time, they made one very fateful decision. And that was not to look at the address of any single incumbent. So the result of this redistricting is they put 40 um, they basically put 40% of both houses in with one another. Democrats with Democrats, Republicans with Republicans, Democrats with Republicans, and all the legislature had to do, all the legislators had to decide what they were going to do. Were they going to run in a primary? Were they going to try to move to a more favorable district? Were they going to retire? And at the end of the day, what that meant is that uh, probably we're going to see, we see a large turnover. One third of the Senate is going to be new and uh, approximately 30% of the House is gonna be new. So the redistricting was kind of a term limits for Virginia, a backdoor term limits. Now, interestingly enough, even after the redistricting and after all those changes, there weren't that many competitive seats in, 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 uh, in the election. And there were some people who believe that redistricting actually leads to more competition, but it doesn't necessarily do that. And the reason is that so many people, so many um, folks have their political views are kind of aligned with where they live. So you could redraw the lines in most of Southwest Virginia, 20 different ways. And most of those lines, the vast majority, almost all are gonna be Republican. You go to inner Northern Virginia, they're gonna be Democratic. <clears throat> so there were really uh, at maximum six competitive races, I think in the, um, in the Senate, there were more in the House, maybe eight or 10 on that front. So when I looked at this 
the results of the redistricting before the election in the Senate, I said, in fact, the Democrats have 18 safe seats out of 40. The Republicans have 16. So in order to win, the Democrats need three to get to 21 because the Republicans have the tiebreaker with Lieutenant Governor Sears. Republicans would need four of these. And it was interesting that Governor Youngkin put so much emphasis on flipping the Senate when the reality was that it was going to be quite tough because the Democrats, A, started with an advantage, and B, that a lot of these competitive seats were in places where Governor Youngkin did not do extraordinarily well in 2021. So the Democrats had to win a seat in Western Henrico here with Skylar Van Valkenburg and Siobhan Donovan. They spent over, I think, about $9 million for a job that pays 18000 and at the end of the day, uh, Schuyler Van Valkenburg, the Democrat, coasted to victory. He won by nine points, largely because Henrico County is becoming a Democratic county. And um, the Governor Yunkin did commercials with Siobhan Donovan. He was out rallying there. He spent an enormous amount of his PAC money on that race. And at the end of the day, it was just going to be very tough to flip, and he didn't succeed. Uh, and then there were two other races in Northern Virginia where the Democrats were able to get the majority. Uh, Danica Rome, running for Senate, who people know as the first transgender uh, member of the General Assembly. Uh, she ran up in Prince William County. There was some sense that that race could be a little more competitive because the public uh, concern about data center locations in Prince William County, too close to residential areas, um, were seen to be controversial. And her opponent was running uh, very explicitly on a platform of prohibiting transgender students from in K-12 from participating in athletics. And there was some concern about whether or not uh, anti-trans sentiment would, would be evident in that election. Uh, Danica Rahm won, won that election, perhaps not by as much as Democrats normally do, but still won it by two to three points there. <clears throat> and then third, thirdly, there was an election in Loudoun County, where, uh, again, the, the, the Democrats thought it was a very important election for them. They nominated uh, a Russet Perry, a um, <clears throat> former prosecutor who had also worked for the CIA, uh, had, had a background very similar to that of Abigail Spanberger. Republicans nominated uh, Juan Pablo Segura, um, son of a billionaire, a fairly charismatic guy who... Um, had actually recently moved to Loudoun. It was an extraordinarily expensive race. Over $11 million was spent. But again, um, in all of these three races that the Democrats won, uh, reproductive rights, abortion was just absolutely central to getting the majority um, there. Republicans were able to win the seats in Hampton Roads, which had been a better place for Governor Yunkin all along. But at the end of the day, that 15 week limit just did not work for Governor Youngkin, because by and large, I think what happened is that most people saw a ban as a step backward. The Republicans had thought that this might work because if you just poll on the 15 week ban or 15 week limit, however you want to call it, in by itself, it doesn't poll terribly. Some polls have it with a positive sense. Some folks have it moderately negative, but it's not a terrible poll. But however, if you compare that to the alternative, which is let's stay where we are um, with, with Roe, then that ban polls worse. And the, and the other problem it has is that it actually counters what you might call the Republican brand. If the Republicans are people who believe in individual freedom, don't want big government, uh, when you start talking about abortion bans, and you start seeing legislation like you do in Texas, where people are even talking about trying to prevent individuals from crossing state lines to get an abortion. Um, this has been bad. So the issue that was devastating for Republicans throughout the summer became devastating for them again here in Virginia um, this time. And the same actually was true in the House. There were a lot of people who thought going into this House race that the Democrats will keep the Senate, but the Republicans will keep the House. Um, I didn't particularly see that. I always saw the House as going to be extraordinarily competitive because after the redistricting again, I thought the Democrats probably had a slight advantage, maybe 48 seats leaning their way, 47 seats leaning the Republican way. And again, 
with some of these other seats being up in Northern Virginia, I thought the Democrats had a chance that most of these competitive races are what you would call suburban exurban areas where the abortion issue is going to play as a, as a centerpiece, because that's where it's been doing nationally. It did that in Virginia and the Democrats were able to actually rest a 51-49 majority in the House. Um, I just might add one final point. Republicans were actually fairly fortunate that the House wasn't worse, that by and large, um, if you just added two points to the Republican side in every House race, they would have got one more seat. But if you added two points to the House race in the Democratic side, they would have got six more seats. So the five more seats, excuse me. So the close races, by and large, were tilting toward the Democrats and the Republicans were fortunate enough to win a lot of those very, very close races um, in the House. Um, so what does this mean going forward now? And uh, what kind of new General Assembly will we have? And I think there are three points to make in thinking about the General Assembly that's coming up. Uh, the first is the geographic um, changes that's occurring in terms of the power structure. The power structure right now has been um, in the Senate in Northern Virginia and the Republican power structure. Um, they've had a little bit in Hampton Roads, but a lot of rural people in the House that they've had. This is changing dramatically now. Uh, Northern Virginia is being many of their uh, stalwarts and longtime folks either retired or were beaten in primaries by more progressive Democrats there. So what you're seeing in terms of a lot of the power structure is that you're seeing more of it in Hampton Roads. Uh, in, the, in the House, Don Scott, the speaker is from Portsmouth. In uh, the Senate, Louise Lucas, the Senate uh, president and now chairman of Senate Finance is also from Portsmouth. So it's not just Hampton Roads, but these people are coming from uh, one of the most economically disadvantaged uh, cities in the state. So that, that's, that's quite a change in terms of the power structure. The other point I would make for the people who live in this area is RVA has almost no one um, who is in the power structure on the Democratic side right now. They have, they've elected a lot of new delegates, a lot of new cook folks. Uh, maybe there'll be one person who chairs a, um, a committee or two, but by and large, in terms of the, the power in Virginia, uh, Central Virginia and the Richmond area uh, is not going to have a lot, of, a lot of power at the moment right now. Yeah. Secondly, uh, beyond that, demographically, there's a dramatic change. And, and that change is right now, when you think about the power structure and you think about the Democrats, there are more African-Americans in the um, General Assembly than we've ever seen before. It's almost 20 percent of the House and the Democrat African-Americans make up probably a little more than 40 percent of the Democratic or 20 percent in the Senate, excuse me, and almost 40 percent of the Democratic caucus in the House. So if the Legislative Black Caucus um, sees this opportunity and grasps it, um, and we'll have to see what happens there. Um, they really have that opportunity. They hold the, as I said, the chair of Senate Finance, the chair of House Appropriations, they have the president pro tem, and they have the Speaker of the House. So the question is, do they move that agenda there? And then thirdly, ideologically, the Democrats have certainly, I think, overall moved um, somewhat in a more progressive direction as a result of the election. What we saw is that in the Democratic primaries that occurred, uh, especially in Northern Virginia, what occurred were that progressive Democrats beat what I would call kind of center left Democrats ideologically. Uh, younger folks um, beat older folks there. And um, some of what we call the pro-business Democrats in Northern Virginia were defeated um, by more progressive candidates. Where the Democrats needed to win in competitive races, they tended to nominate individuals uh, that had um, probably less of an ideological bent than you might see in some, some of the, the primary elections that occurred. But overall, 
I think what you're going to see out of the Democratic Party here is um, an, an effort to sort of uh, counter what they consider to be some of Governor Yunkin's directions. So that gets me to the final comments I want to make um, about this, uh, about what's happening now, is that Governor Yunkin now faces, for sure, he's been in divided government for the first two years, has saw that his agenda was in many ways uh, stymied, uh, in some ways, by the Democrats in, in, in the Senate, and now faces a Democratic Party that controls both chambers. So by and large, here's what I would, I would say, that um, for Governor Yunkin, I think a lot of the culture war issues are going to go nowhere uh, there. And in fact, uh, I think he's going to have to make some far more accommodation than he has. That, that by and large, uh, I would also note that there was some frustration with the governor by Republicans during this campaign cycle and going forward. And it was all uh, related to the um, purported national aspirations that the governor had. The governor always said that he wasn't running for office now. I'm not in Iowa, I'm not in South Carolina, I'm not in New Hampshire, but had never made a declarative statement that said, I will not run for president. And interestingly enough, he still didn't uh, the day after the election. And there were a number of Republicans frustrated with that because they didn't think running these ads about the 15 week abortion ban was good. They thought they were he was running the election on democratic turf and that they were gonna lose, it wasn't a good thing. And so they remained frustrated a little bit with the national aspirations. So um, my sense is that for the governor, he's gonna to have to focus on the kind of things that uh, where there's agreement with the Democrats. And by and large, that's going to be um, certain economic development issues. So I think those policies are going to have to be tilted a little more to those at the bottom of the income scale. He's going to be talking about workforce issues. I think mental health reform that we've had can still go forward. I think there's some uh, opportunities for accommodation on working on uh, the opioid and the, uh, the, cri the, the drug uh, addiction crises that we have that you see both in rural and urban areas. So there's some places they can work together. I think um, spending to try to uh, um, ensure that schools that deal with learning loss, that schools have um, uh, do better job recruiting teachers, they can make teachers better, uh, find a way to recruit more, more to the profession. So that's gonna require, I think, de-emphasizing uh, de some of the culture war issues. Um, and trying to get more special ed teachers, which we're really struggling with right now. So there's some of those opportunities. At the same time, I, I don't want to minimize uh, the distrust that exists between the Democrats and the governor uh, over the last few years. And some of that distrust is going to be uh, connected to the leadership issues. Uh, the Democrat chair of Senate Finance, Louise Lucas, has been the governor's principal nemesis for the past few years in, in, in many ways. Um, she's an interesting figure. She's 79 years old, one of the most distinctive personalities in the Virginia General Assembly. She, as a background, was the first sh woman shipfitter at Newport News um, shipyards. And after the election, she um, has a, a Twitter account that had um, a number of salty, uh, what I would call, she uh, tweets that she uh, is comfortable using salty language. Uh, in fact, she said in one of these tweets that she speaks two languages, she said, um, English and shipyard. Um, so the governor likes to put on his Twitter account that he's a former dishwasher. He's going to be up against the ship fitter here. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see where that relationship goes. Uh, Speaker Scott has already said that um, he is thoroughly uninterested in some of the governor's educational policies that would promote lab schools or dollars going to private entities to put schools in that what he wants to do is to focus on using public dollars for public schools. So we're going to see, see that as well. So it will be interesting to see whether or not uh, Governor Youngkin can recover 
There are a lot of people who believe that this election was devastating to his political aspirations, not only in 24, but 28. Um, you know, there's a lot of time to go before that. Um, but at the same time, it just appears to me that what he won't be able to do is to have sort of be a Virginia governor and a national aspirant at the same time, uh, or else this thing is going to uh, get worse before it gets better. Finally, I would just say that as soon as the election was over, people started uh, announcing for the political offices that will occur in 2024. In Virginia, there's going to be three important congressional races. The Democrats would like to flip the seat that Jen Kiggins has down in the Virginia Beach area. And they already have a candidate, Missy Smalsell, about that. And then because of the fact that Jennifer Wexton is leaving for health reasons in Congressional District 10, that's going to be highly competitive. And then again on Congressional District 7, because Abigail Spanberger announced uh, a day after the election or a couple days after the election that she's running for governor. So we have those three seats, Tim Kaine's Senate seat and a presidential race. I did not mention, but I should mention that Joe Biden has horrible numbers in Virginia. I think he probably would beat Donald Trump, but uh, the Democrats have ignored that. They try to pretend that it doesn't, they don't exist, but his numbers have been uh, in the high 30s, low 40s since the um, Afghanistan withdrawal debacle that occurred uh, at early in his presidency, haven't recovered um, there. At the same time, the Democrats already have two people who announced for uh, governor or will announce for probably Abigail Spanberger for sure. LeVar Stoney, the mayor of Richmond, says he's getting ready to announce. And one can presume that at least two Republicans, the attorney general, lieutenant governor will run. So um, there are a lot of people dislike the fact that Virginia has these elections every year. Um, I often say I love it uh, largely because it's uh, the full employment policy for political pundits. So, uh, Robin, if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. <laughs> well, Dr. Holsworth, I have plenty of questions, as you can imagine, but so do our uh, do our guests. But thank you so much. Just what an outstanding uh, overview and coverage of really what people call the off, off, off year election um, mm -hmm. that occurred last Tuesday, but really, in all honesty, has huge impacts, as you've mentioned, in a variety of ways for Virginia uh, and for the United States when we look at congressional races. So I want to start with, you said that clearly Virginia was a purple state leaning blue prior to Governor Yunkin's election for governor. What was this going to be with the standing would be, be purple leaning red. Clearly last Tuesday showed that the De Democrats prevailed in both the House and Senate. Are we still pretty much a purple leaning blue state? And do we look at Governor Yunkin's election for governor two years ago as being that outlier? Or was it um, perhaps messaging in that space, as you mentioned, around his pre presidential interest that maybe had an impact here too? Yeah. I think it's, um, I think that's probably true that we're probably still purple, leaning a little bit of blue. But he here, here's the point. I think the Democrats between 2017 and 2021 got very complacent and misread in part what, ha what was happening in Virginia. That Virginia had always been a very close state. When it became, when the Democrats started winning these elections by eight or 10 points, that was because of Donald Trump, right. who's extraordinarily unpopular in Virginia. You know, he says he wants to drain the swamp in, North, in, in Washington, which is an assault on Northern Virginia. And so while Trump is very popular in the rural areas in Virginia, not so popular either in um, Northern Virginia or in, in increasingly in RBA, Henrico and Chesterfield. Uh, Henrico is a, a democratic place now. It's uh, 20 or 30 points in, a, in an election. Even in the Board of Supervisors, the Democrats selected four out of the five Board of Supervisors members in Henrico County, um, including a woman uh, in Western Henrico who spent $10,000, her opponent spent 20 times more. Um, she won, she's actually a VCU grad, uh, an extraordinary story, had a child at 15, went into the military, came back, was a summa cum laude graduate of VCU, graduate of Women Mary Law School, and wins this election uh, 20 points down, uh, with you know 20 to one financial disadvantage, Misty Whitehead. 
So anyway, um, my sense is that uh, Virginia is still that. But here's what I would say. There was one thing that happened in 2021 that I'm not sure the Democrats are going to remedy overnight. And that is the bottom completely dropped out in rural Virginia for the Democrats or any place outside the way you might say it, the three major metropolitan areas. Um, so if you look at Southwest Virginia, what happened, there were places where the Democrats went from 30% of the vote to 15%. What I call the, the Liberty University suburbs, uh, Bedford, Campbell County, they get 20, 21% of the vote. So in some sense, Yunkin did better in the rural areas than Trump did. Um, and if that stays the case for the Democrats, that poses the problem. So two, two issues. I still think we're by and large, um, you know, purple trending blue, especially in Northern Virginia and more so now in Henrico County and a little bit in Chesterfield. Um, but certainly uh, the challenge for the Democrats is, the, um, is Hampton Roads is an area where the Republicans are running well. And then the, the bottom dropping out in rural Virginia um, largely, I think, because of these cultural slash political issues remains a continuing challenge. The, the places in rural Virginia where the Democrats do well is where there's a college town. <laughs> you know, Blacksburg, JMU, they, they, do, they do well in Harrisonburg. Um, but outside of that, they don't do so well. Well, that is that's a great point. And, and I think, you know, there was an article this morning um, that talked about the fact that now Delegate Rasul is literally the only Democrat representing, you know, uh, west of Roanoke, right? You know, because they lost, um, you know, with redistricting that. So that really does point out a really important aspect of the differentiation. I will say, because I always want to make a point to, to highlight our Commonwealth poll, what you talk about, though, in this interesting situation is, Biden on our poll as well should perform very poorly um, in Virginia and in his satisfaction. And interestingly enough, you know, our poll had Governor Yunkin beating Biden if they were head to head. Um, and so I do think you show this kind of there's going to be some interest in Virginia moving forward in this kind of purple leaning blue, but not guaranteed blue, um, which will continue to, I think, make competitive races. We do have a couple of questions. You mentioned redistricting, both the commission you chaired for um, Governor McDonald and the, the challenges and failure uh, uh, of the redistricting commission. So um, we're seeing that they're uh, in the news. There are two seats that have some residency issues um, of candidates that won. Uh, do you see anything actually transpiring in these two situations around the residency challenges of our two candidates that won their seat last uh, Tuesday? Yeah, I, I think they're really tough to, to say that these are going to be legally problematic. Uh, and I'm not an attorney, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that with which to begin. But so take a look at the one here. They're complaining about um, Ghazala Hashmi that she has a, um, a home that's in Glenn Sturdivant's district. She got an apartment in the new district that she moved into, won that race pretty easily. And former Senator Chase is now saying that, you know, and has a bunch of residents saying, well, she really lived in the, um, you know, in her home in Midlothian in the Sturdivant district, doesn't live there. But she did rent an apartment in the new district. And it just seems to me that how do you prove that you know, she's not going to live there or something like that. It, it, it's very tough. Like uh, Senator Chase said, well, she hasn't put her house up for sale. Well, she didn't have to put her house up for sale. You know, there are a lot of people who have multiple residences. Um, and so the question, she's going to have to move into that district for sure. But the, what happened is that because of this redistricting and all the changes that occurred, um, Senator Hashmi is not the only person who rented an apartment <laughs> In the, in, in the new district. And I'll give just an example from two years ago. There's now um, Delegate-elect Mark Early. Uh, he ran two years ago in a House Republican primary. And his, um, his opponent raised the issue that he didn't live in the district. And so what Delegate Early did at that time was that he moved into his father's basement. And I happen to know about that because his father lives in my neighborhood. Um, 
Now, how much time he actually spent in the basement or his family spent in that basement, I don't know. Um, if he won, he was certainly going to have to have a full-time residence in the district. But I'm not sure that you can say that the person who got an apartment in the district um, and is paying rent on that apartment uh, doesn't necessarily live there on the basis of, you know, of some, uh, you know, uh, testimony from the neighbors at right now. And I doubt that the courts are going to want to get into that at that level um, right now. I think that if she was thinking that she was going to still live in Midlothian most of the time, that's not going to happen any longer right. as a result of this. But I, I just can't imagine this, you know, and finally her opponent said that, you know, he should just be declared the winner, right. yes. which is just even absurd. though he lost by 27 points, <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't see that having a having a big issue. So. Yeah, I do. I do think you're right. One of the things that we hear a lot about Virginia is our residency requirements for running are are very uh, loose, shall we say, or lax. And so, you know, that's that's just kind of one of the challenges that that, that is there. But but your point is well taken. Even if for some reason that were to change with uh, Senator Hashme, it is still a very clear Democrat seat district that you know the that would have to have an election. Um, and so and I, I don't see how you get around not having an election. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah ex exactly, exactly. Right. Uh, so, well, I do want to ask a question here. You know, one of the things you mentioned, and and clearly we saw both in the spending and in the conversations, is uh, reproductive rights. Women's reproductive rights were the top issue that we saw, especially in those four districts that you spoke about very clearly. Do you think that we will see potentially now with a Democrat-controlled House and Senate an idea of a constitutional amendment. Now we understand that there's a process that needs to happen, right? You know, with the intervening election and things like that. But do we think that we could see an idea about that when we saw the success that Ohio had in putting forth a constitutional amendment uh, around uh, supporting reproductive rights in the Commonwealth? Oh, absolutely. You're going to see three constitutional amendments that Democrats are going to put forward, I would believe. Uh, the first, certainly on uh, reproductive rights, trying to enshrine the principles of Roe like they did in Ohio and some other places. Um, and that's going to be on, uh, the General Assembly has to vote for that this year and next year. So what that becomes a, an election issue for the governor's campaign. It won't be on the ballot in Virginia, given the way our system works, where you have to have an intervening General Assembly election before you put it on the public ballot. So that won't be on the ballot until 2026, but it's going to be on the every assembly member is going to have to vote for that. And the governor doesn't get a chance to veto that. So you're going to see that one. You're also going to see one on uh, same sex marriage, uh, another uh, area where the the Democrats believe they can um, divide the Republicans there. And then finally, you're going to see a constitutional amendment on the voting rights changes that the Democrats have made. Uh, that in particular, I want to emphasize how important some of these same day registration is uh, in, in how the Democrats use that, especially in the college towns. They could, if they use it even a little better um, at places like Tech and William and Mary and Virginia State, they might have won even more elections there. So the Democrats are going to look at that same day registration and the lines that occurred at colleges and universities across the state, they're gonna say, this is a tremendous benefit for us, particularly if we can have the registration location at the university, if we're not busing people uh, like they had to do at CNU um, down in Hampton Roads. But that, so those three we're going to see because the Democrats just think there's nothing to lose there. And on the reproductive rights issue, they're gonna to continue to use it so long as they're winning on it. Why, why would they change? Absolutely wonderful. And the, the same day voting was really, you're exactly right, Dr. Holsworth, just amazing. When you think about um, specifically those races, as you mentioned in that Williamsburg, James City County area, I mean, you're talking about very small numbers 
um, of winds on both sides, similarly in Petersburg. So that that was really that that idea, that concept around college campuses is, is very much a, a winning idea that can be expanded upon for Democrats. Um, okay, yeah, yeah so the one place, I would just say, Robin, the one place that it didn't occur, I, I read something which I, I can't absolutely confirm that the Democrats were getting 90% above plus uh, and above on all of these college campuses, with one exception, and that was Liberty University. Exactly. I was going to say Liberty Liberty University. Yes, exactly right. Um, and then some folks were looking at VCU's turnout, but forgetting that uh, we did not have a strong, you know, we had uh, Senator uh, Bagby went running unopposed, uh, Delegate Jones running, really re winning one unopposed. But what we did have in, in Richmond, and we have several questions about, which um, gets us to a little bit of local politics as we move into the last 15 minutes of our time together, is the casino vote referendum in Richmond. Um, clearly, it was voted and barely um, lost uh, the year you know previously. Um, it was put back on the ballot this year. Um, they lost at a higher percentage. Uh, so to vote no for a casino in Richmond. Um, my first question from the audience is, what are your thoughts about that? And then, of course, I want to ask you how that might also impact Mayor Stoney's uh, gubernatorial uh, aspirations as well. Yeah, well, you know, they um, the pro casino people spent um, three times as much as they did last time. Yes, $400 per person in the city of Richmond, I think, was a, an analysis from the Wall Street Journal. They did... Um, they did an enormous amount of polling beforehand on how to name the casino. I got a lot of these polls on my, my phone. Um, you know, they, they talked about, you know, being a jobs develop, you know, a, a jobs machine that are going to be entertainment. Um, going to have pickleball courts going to be something quite different. Um, and at the same time, the opponents, you know, didn't spend very much at all. Uh, on this, but what what happened? I think were were two or three things occurred. First, among the people who voted no, they were somewhat insulted that they had to vote again in two years. So they there there was a sort of an antagonism that was generated by the very fact that I thought we said no, and now we have to say it again. So you had that, and then secondly, you had the campaign that was run uh, by the pro people that these are some of the worst campaign one's ever seen and the last week to hold that to have that radio show in which they used uh, racial slurs to describe uh, you know other members of the african-american community in which they used uh, anti-semitic tropes to talk about uh, paul goldman as the uh, uh who was one of the opponents they called one of the business persons, Jim Ucroft, demented. Um, and that, and after that, they then went on, uh, my, you know, the most remarkable part to me after all of that was Kathy Hughes, who was putting $10 million into it, saying, you know, I've just paid off everybody essentially here. You know, I've given money uh, to lawyers, accountants, lobbyists. I've given donations to a million, you know, you know hundreds, you know, tens of organizations and nobody and no one seems to still like this um uh, it was just bizarre and that even juiced i think the opposition to come out so at the end of the day uh the people in the areas that they thought were going to come out did not come out very long there was not a big turnout in the eighth or ninth district while at the same time it juiced the turnout among the opponents so it was it was a devastating defeat um you know, it's, it's hard to imagine how it's anything but problematic um, for the mayor. I've heard some people say, well, he's going to talk about how he cared about jobs, how he was trying to do something um, for uh, the economically disadvantaged parts of Richmond. But I don't think that is necessarily something that's going to sell in a statewide campaign. So um, he says he's going to run for pre run for governor. Um, I just think it's an uphill climb against Abigail Spanberger that um, she's been elected in two almost entirely separate congressional districts, one that spans Enrico Chesterfield, another that goes Prince William Stafford. Uh, her name recognition is off the charts on that, for that reason, gonna be higher. And then secondly, uh, we'll have to see who 
the mayor is able to get to come behind him when if he does announce for governor, because Spanberger already has one former governor, two congressional people, including Jennifer Wexton, who's leaving Congressional 10. Um, and so long as nobody gets in the race in Northern Virginia, who is what I would call a progressive who's left of Spanberger, it just appears to me that she's going to be tough to beat in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Very, very insightful as as always in that space. Well, you did mention uh, the governor's race, and, and I think your you know your your comments and thoughts about uh, both Mayor Stoney and Congresswoman Spanberger make a great statement and a great point. So. What are your thoughts on who um, will be, we, you, you mentioned the gubernatorial candidates on the Republican side with uh, the Lieutenant Governor and the Attorney General. Um, do you see, do you have any thoughts on who might be in the field for Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General on either side of the aisle? Um, following with, uh, um, you, you um, know, Spamberg. Oh, you I, I know, know that's, a, that's a lot of, a lot of predicting, but um, yeah, you may know there. we had a, a, we had a question about that. Well, I was going to say, you may know if there's a McDougal involved or not. So that, more not than one I, that I'm aware of, sir. <laughs> there, so. um, no, I mean, on the Democratic side for um, Attorney General, I expect Jay Jones, obviously, who ran last time to be involved. I expect Shannon Taylor, uh, the Commonwealth Attorney from, from Henrico, whether or not you see somebody else come in from Northern Virginia, uh, I would expect that. I don't know. Um, somebody who might be very attractive, but I haven't heard anything about him actually is this uh, Tim Heafy, who had been, uh, yes. you know, the, the counsel to the January 6th committee. He, he would bring, if he decided, he, he has speculated that he might get involved in politics, some stature. stature. Um, you know, the Republican side, we're just going to have to see. I think the first question on the Republican side is who runs for um, governor. And obviously, um, you know, there's some question about whether or not both the attorney general and the lieutenant governor would run. Uh, some people think they'll, you know, one will decide to drop back. That's never good. Uh, I don't know anybody who's dropped back and won, uh, when, you know, the next time around. Uh, that, both that's sides of the aisle, but both yeah, that's usually no bowling in Mark Gary. So, so uh, that's an interesting race because I think Mayeris would almost come off as the establishment Republican candidate. Uh, Winston Sears, sort of a candidate of the grassroots. I think she would actually be the favorite that I uh, hate, you know, I've talked to a lot of Republicans who think that might be the case. I just don't know. Um, but I think both of them would have an uphill climb. If Spanberger is a Democratic nominee, um, this is not going to be an easy race for either of those two to beat her. Yes, it, we, we might just see our uh, first female governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, independent of, of party, if there could be a very yeah, interesting you could have race that choice, if we had right, two that's, women. That's possible. Yes, yes, yeah. really great race. Um, well, last question um, that we have from the group is, do you have any thoughts? There are some conversations around with um, Abigail Spanberger running for governor that the Republicans think they could potentially flip that seat in Congress. Uh, what are your thoughts there based on what we've been talking about um, through last Tuesday's elections and that that kind of population that she's representing now? Yeah, I think they would certainly try to flip that seat. I, I think a lot of what what's going to happen in 2024 depends on the Republican nominee. Mm -hmm. So if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, once again, my sense is that it's going to be t very tough for Republicans in any Northern Virginia seat. Mm -hmm. Now the Spanberger seat's not just sort of inner Northern Virginia, but it has, it does have a lot of Eastern Prince William in it, which is heavily democratic. Then it goes down to Stafford, Spotsylvania, and has some more rural areas attached to it. Um, you know, she won that seat relatively handily, too. She won it by four or five points. So uh, if Donald Trump's the nominee, I see no possible way that the Republicans could make up that make up that margin. And at the moment, um, he certainly looks like the Republican nominee. So if, if he's the Republican nominee, I think it's a, uh, a wonderful a uh, year for the Democrats in Northern Virginia. And the only question then becomes whether um, Jen Kiggins uh, could, keep, could keep the seat. 
so as um, as, as poor as Biden's ratings are, I think that's the case. The, 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 the problem that Biden has, I'll just say this before we go, Robin, is that if you look at this last election, the Democrats, for the most part, were not relying on the voters that are most reluctant to vote again for Biden there. you got a lot of younger voters who don't come out very, who don't come out very much other than we saw in the college towns uh, where, where they did to some degree. Um, and there's a possible sort of nibbling at the edges with these third party candidates, Cornell West, Jill Stein, Green Party. You could see a little bit of that. I think RFK actually takes the anti-vaxxers. That probably hurts Trump a little bit. But I think Biden could be could be harmed there by some of the sort of nibbling at the edges of, of, of the folks. And, and the fact that what we also see is among a number of um, more economically disadvantaged communities, whether that be Latin America, uh, Latinos or African-Americans, um, there has been less support for Biden there as well in a lot of polling that we're seeing. Um, and when they, you run statewide or nationally, you're going to need uh, that kind of turnout, which was not necessarily needed to win in Loudoun County, for example, right now, um, as we saw last week. So I don't, uh, you know, I think that Trump will not be popular in Virginia, but I don't want to minimize the challenges the Democrats have by sticking with um a person who's going to be 82 years old. So uh, thanks again for letting me do this, Robin. And Dr. Holdsworth, it's always one of my most, most favorite days of the year, um, getting to spend time with you and the great questions that we had from our audience. This is absolutely outstanding. And just like you, I love the fact that Virginia has election every year because uh, <laughs> it gives us an opportunity to spend some time um, analyzing those with you. So with that, I will turn it back over to our Wilder School team. Uh, so thank you. Thank you both. Um, before I go forward with my announcements, Dean Gooden, did you have anything you wanted to add? Oh, no, thank yes. you again, Bob. We really appreciate your tremendous insight and um, all of your excellent analysis, giving us a lot to think, uh, to think food for thought. And uh, we'll, we'll all watch and see what's ahead uh, politically for Virginia and the nation. So back to you, Stephen. No problem. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, Dean Gooden, thank you, Robin, and thank you, Bob, for a great talk today. Um, thank you to our collaborators, VCU Alumni uh, Political Science Caucus. Um, before we leave, just a few reminders. Um, again, we will be celebrating um, and honoring 70 years of leadership and service on two dates in the new year, January 17th, for a documentary premiere for Governor Wilder and then the National Ovation Gala on January 20th. The link in the chat will uh, give you more details about that. Next, save the date for our February 21st Lunch and Learn. Um, so again, we will be um, celebrating the governor in January, and we hope you can join us there. Um, and then again in February, we will return to our alumni lunch and learn series. And last but not least, happy holidays, everyone. Um, since we will not see the folks that uh, join us monthly um, in December and January, we just want to say happy holidays from the Wilder School. You all have a great rest of your day.